So the first question, let's start by defining what econometrics is. Uh, let's start by defining what econometrics is. So literally speaking, econometrics refers to the measurements in economics. Okay, it just refers to the measurements in economics. Just as I did indicate yesterday that most of the variables that you look at, um, they are qualitative in nature, and it is very difficult to examine the relationship among the qualitative variables. It is easy to do that when you have the quantitative variables. So econometrics is very necessary, or it, 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 it helps us to at least examine the relationship. And with econometrics, we can manage even to convert the information of those qualitative variables and make them quantitative that we can be able to at least get the relationships, especially using the numbers. So econometrics refers to the measurements in economics. It is a set of statistical techniques that are used to evaluate quantitative relationship using empirical data, okay? From this context, from the both, both context of economics and beyond, not, it's not just limited to economics, okay? Yeah, it, it goes beyond economics, economics, yeah. So now what is the motivation behind the econometrics, okay? Econometrics is widely applied in academia, in the public, in the private sector, and in many other organizations. Yeah, the concepts that we learn from econometrics are widely applied. They are used in the world of academ academics. We, we use econometrics in the public, private sector, and many other organizations. So economics is very, very necessary. So what are some of the applications, okay? What are some of the areas in which you can apply econometrics? You can use econometrics to, econometrics to test the empirical validity of hypotheses. Just reminding you a bit of what you learned in statistics. There is a topic maybe you did that is called the hypothesis testing, right? So what happens during hypothesis testing? You are testing the validity of the existing statement. For example, if you are given, um, someone comes and say, no, the mean age, the mm. mean age of the first year students, let's say the, the full-time guys, let's use the full-time guys. The first year, someone says they are 19 years old, okay? Somebody says they are 19 years old. And then that statement mm. can stand for a long time. Others will just come and read it. Oh, they are 19 years old and get it like they are 19 years old. Okay. Then somebody will be inquisitive, right? Somebody will be inquisitive and say, no, uh, actually, we want to find out whether it is true that uh, these guys are 19 years old, isn't it? That is what they are going to do. Now, what they do is that they, they go, they collect the data the data about these students, so they can go and ask them, right? Ask them the questions and ask, uh, how old are you? Okay, people will be giving age, their age, no, 19. Others will say I'm 18, others will say 17. Others will say 20, others 21, okay? Then afterwards, the mean will be calculated, isn't it? The mean will be calculated after calculating the mean. Now, if you find that, <clears throat> if you find that uh, the mean that you have found, it is uh, not equal to 19, okay? The mean age on average, what do you do? You reject uh, the now hypothesis, this existing statement You say, no, actually it is not true that these guys are 19 years old on the average. On average, they are maybe 20 years old, okay? Which means you have discovered some new truth or you have uh, tested the statement that was already there, okay? By going out yourself, you go out as an individual, collect data, after collecting data, test 
the validity of what was said before. And uh, that is what uh, hypothesis testing is all about. You do that in econometrics. So you use those skills. So the, the existing statement, for example, the first one is called the now hypothesis. And then there is a hypothesis that you set, okay, to test that other one. It's usually the opposite and called the alternative hypothesis. So you, in, under the alternative hypothesis, if you say the now hypothesis is equal to is equal to 19, which is the now hypothesis is equal that uh, mean, the mean age is 19, then the alternative hypothesis is not equal to 19. You just say the mean is not equal to 19. You set up that, then you collect the data. After collecting the data, what do you do after collecting the data? You test the relationship and you test the validity of this statement. That is what this point indicates. Is there any question? Hello. No, not the moment, not on my end. Madam Nyambe, do you have any question about that one? No, thank you. I'm okay now. Okay. So, so, so basically, that is what the, the, the point means. Evaluating mm -hmm. policy, we can use econometrics to evaluate policy. And you know that mostly the public sector is full of, of, of policies, okay? There are those policies that were laid uh, or they were set by people of old. Uh, yeah, so what happens is that uh, you will not just keep on accepting everything you've found in any place. Actually, in academics, especially when you just do research, you like you'll be interested in always questioning. And we are always encouraged to question, not just accepting everything the way how it comes. At least you should be willing to just go out. Even when you are reading any book, not because everything is printed out is true. Like learn to question and find out the methods that at least you can use to test whether that is really true, okay? Do the questioning even when you are reading any book. Yeah, don't just take it because it's a printed material and it is true. Uh, I, I think maybe the, the only space where you can, the only book that you cannot question more is the Bible, isn't it? The Bible to Christians, you can't question too much, right? But even in the Bible, we question. And as we question, but we use the same Bible to get deeper and to understand more, right? But uh, yeah. But most of these other books, we really question them. We question, we are, we, we are doubtful, you know, we are, we are not always just saying, okay, everything that they have been said is true. But with the Bible, it's a gospel truth. Okay, away from that one. So we use econometrics to evaluate policy. We use econometrics to predict and forecast. Okay, you can forecast, you can predict using econometrics, right? Now, what is the approach? What is the approach? Okay. The conventional approach to econometric analysis hinges around the following. Number one, theory and hypothesis formulation. You will be trained on how to formulate theory. There has been a lot of theories that have been expounded by people of old in various fields of study. For example, in econometrics, uh, in economics, you have got uh, theories. Let me give one of the theories. The theory that was uh, expounded by Baumo about, about the impact of interest rate on what? On money, on the demand of money. You get it? It was said that when you increase the interest rate, what happens to the demand of money? The demand of money lessens, of hoarding money, of course. It lessens. Those are some, some of the theories. So the person, what happened is that he collected the data and tested the, that relationship, the impact of interest rates. After testing, he discovered that it is actually true that the interest rate um, affect the what? Eh? They negatively affect the, the money hoarding, the, the, the money hoarding demand. And after that, he wrote that, okay? It was written down, this is what is there. That is called a theory. The theory is formed. 
Now, when the theory is formed, it has to be tested, okay? Mm. Other people have to repeat it. He will explain the methods and the models that the person used, the methods of data collection and everything. Afterwards, then the, 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 the theory will be tested by other researchers. They will repeat it and find out if they're getting the same thing, okay? If they are getting the same thing, it has been tested. That is called the empirical literature. They review the literature and they test it empirically. After testing it empirically, then they'll approve the theory. Okay, then the, the theory gets added in books and the, in the field of study. Okay, everyone will be agreeing to that because the theory has been what, tested. So in econometrics, you'll learn how to set theory, how to formulate the theory and how to formulate the propositions and hypotheses. Is that clear? Yes, yes. You learn how to come up with the empirical model. You learn how to choose data and estimate the method and the estimation methods. You learn how to do estimations, how to evaluate and how to draw conclusions, especially after testing the hypothesis. Clear? Yes. All right. Let's continue with the approach. So researchers and econometricians have actually a variety of research questions. And most of these research questions have the policy implications, okay? But most of the theory does not quantify the causal effect, okay? So these, these the theories that we're talking about, that the researchers have, and uh, most of the times these theories, they do not quantify. The keyword here is quantify. Let me use the red marker, I think. Is quantify, just as I said. The theories do not quantify the causal effect or the causal relationship. So as a result of that, what has there are just qualitative variables, the qualitative relationship that is not quantified. People tend to what to econometrics because econometrics helps in um, quantifying the causal effect. Okay, the examples of um, the relationships we might be interested in finding out would say what is the price elasticity of cigarettes? Okay, how responsive? Okay, is the quantity of cigarettes consumed uh, to price changes? in cigarettes. What is the effect of reducing the class size on student achievement? Those are questions, right? We are interested in knowing out, uh, in, in finding out. Um, if we reduce the, the class size, maybe to only two people, three people, five people, 10 people in class maximum, and what is, what does, what is the impact of that, okay, on the achievement or performance of the students, right? When you look at these, <laughs> these are qualitative variables. It's, it's, it's not, of course, the size you can manage to quantify. What about uh, achievement of students? You see, it can be very difficult to, 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 to just get this as it is, unless you quantify the other variable, for example, the achievement of students, because it's so general. So you need to tend to numbers to find the means of converting the achievements of students into to numbers so that you can manage to regress the equation. That's what we mean. So what is the effect of earnings on education? Okay, of, of what is the effect on earnings of a year of education? If you get educated, you add one year in your education. What is the impact of that on your salaries? That's the question. What is the effect of output or growth of a percentage point increase in interest rate by the central bank? The question is, what is the, in, uh, the impact of the interest rate on the output growth? That's the question. If the central bank increases the interest rate, what is the impact of that on output, right? On the growth output. And you have all those all those questions. 
So most of the experiments that we carry out, um, we have got say, two controlled and uncontrolled experiments. Okay, let's start with the controlled experiments. So the focus of the course, it is to use the statistic and econometric methods to quantify the causal effect, just as I said. Ideally, we would like to conduct a controlled experiment with the cigarette prices, the class size, the returns on education, the central bank interest rate, et cetera, et cetera. But most of the time, we cannot do so, okay? Must, <clears throat> must use observational or non-experimental data. Because we can't use a controlled experiment. So we, we tend to use the non, okay, so, uh, the observational, the observational uh, experiment where we just observe. And so we get data, we observe what happens. We try to do this and see what happens later on, okay. Observational studies pose major challenges, okay, for example, we consider the estimation of the returns on education, right? Or, or to education, the returns to education. Confounding effects, that is uh, to say omitted factors. Yesterday, I, 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 in the introduction, I said that sometimes as you are forming up or as you're forming this model, you have to add as many variables as possible, right? But sometimes you may have a challenge of not including a necessary variable, some, variable, some variables that are impactive to the model. So you see those are challenges. You, you see the effect of the omitted variables as you're going to move on, okay? Testing simultaneous causality correlation does not usually necessarily imply causation. Those are just some of the things that we look at under observational studies. Now, the main objective of the course, okay, is that at the end of it all, you have to learn how to use the methods for estimating the causal effect using observational data. You have to learn how to use some tools that can be used for other purposes. For example, for casting using time series data. You should be able to learn how to do analysis and evaluate the work of other econometric applications at the end of it all. That's the objective of the, of the course. <clears throat> types of data now. Most of the times we have the three main types of data that I'm going to speak to uh, when the time comes. There is a section usually for these. The cross-sectional data, the time series data and the panel, the panel data, just three types of data. And you learn how to treat them using the statistical packages, especially STATA, from STATA, EVUs, R, okay, MATLAB, among others, but to just stick to maybe two or three of them. Populations, samples, estimators, and the estimates. We start from there. <clears throat> what is a population, right? So a population is basically a total collection of all objects or people to be studied, right? The total collection of all the objectives, objects, sorry, and uh, people that you have to study, then uh, that total collection is called uh, populations, samples. It is just a fraction or the selection of some items from the population. You have the population. Then you, you get some fraction, select some few items from the population. That is called a sample, okay? What are estimators now? Estimators are basically the formulae that are used to calculate the regression coefficients. If you remember yesterday, I, I highlighted about the regression coefficients, beta naught, right? Beta one, X one variable plus the error term, isn't it? These are called the coefficients, okay? <clears throat> These are called the coefficients. Start with the constant, 
the coefficients, these are coefficients of these variables, okay? So the estimators refers to the formulas or the formulae used to calculate the regression coefficients. These, the formulae that you use to come up with these coefficients, okay? That is what we call the estimators. The estimates, therefore, are actual numerical value of the coefficients. For example, we find that the value of beta naught is 2.5, then beta one you find 0.23x like that. This 0.23 is called an estimate. It is an actual value of coefficient as calculated using the what? The estimator. Mostly when we come to the next lecture, we'll have an example, <clears throat> especially on the estimators and how to derive the estimators, okay? So in a simple regression model, let's start with the simple regression model where I said there are just only two variables, right? That's called a simple, just one, of, one independent variable and one dependent variable. You have the constant here plus beta one, which is the, the, the coefficient, of the x variable plus the stochastic variable, which is also represented at epsilon. Okay, that's very, very nice. The stochastic variable or the disturbance. Okay. So <clears throat> let us begin the study with an extensive investigation of the estimation of a linear, linear <clears throat> relationship between the two variables, just x and y variable. Now, mostly you find that there are some key terms or names that are given to these variables. And at least you should be conversant with the names, okay, as how they are correctly used. The Y variable, it is called the dependent variable and sometimes it is called an independent variable. It is also called the explained variable. If you say explained variable, then the X variable become an explanatory variable. If you say the Y variable is a predicant, then the X variable will be the predictor. If you say the Y variable is a regressant, then the regressor will be the X variable. And if you say the Y variable is an outcome, then the covariate variable should be the X variable. Similarly, if you say the response, the Y variable is a response variable, then the stimulus, the stimulating variable or the stimulus should be the X variable. And if you say that the X is a controlled variable, then the control variable should be, so if you say Y is a controlled variable, then the control variable should be X, the X variable. So these just are the names, okay? They mean the same thing. What we want you to be doing is that we don't want such level of, I don't know if it's organization. If you say, no, uh, look at the dependent variable and the predictor. Understand, right? Dependent variable and predictor. We know that the predictor is same as the independent variable, but such level of organization or, or disorganization is not necessary, is not needed. Actually, this is how these weights match in the literature. If you say, if you use the dependent variable for Y, then we expect you to use what? The independent variable to refer to X. Not the dependent variable Y, then you say the control variable. Hmm? Unless you say the control variable, the controlled variable, the stimulus, the response, the covariate variable and the outcome not covariate variable, dependent variable, or covariate variable, explained variable. Any question? Uh, nothing on my end. Madam Nyambe, do you have any question? No questions. Okay. Hopefully I'm not speeding. That's the hope. And people oh, are yeah, following. Like speeding always, uh, uh, always Sorry? intervene. But if we're just speeding, we always still raise our hands. Okay, okay. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we continue. So please get used of these terms. Let them be part of you. We don't want you to be confused when you find the covariate variable in the literature as you are studying. Please get to know that these, they mean the same thing. The population regression function, PRF. Make an imagination, okay? We wish to find the relationship between the father's height and son's height. Just think of that, right? Eh? Now imagine we had all the data of all the fathers and all sons, sons' height in the world. Then we can get the population regression function, isn't it? The population regression function shall be the sons' height, right? Equal to the constant plus C, the coefficient of the father's height. Plus C, the error term, isn't it? The father's height in this case sits as what? As an independent variable, isn't it? It is the independent variable. Whereas the son's height is a dependent variable. That is to say, the son's height is responding to the stimulus, which is the father's height. So the father's height, in other words, determines the outcome of the son's height. So this is the population regression function. Any question? Just an example. Now, what usually happens is that we cannot observe the heights of all fathers and the sons in the world throughout time, isn't it? So we have to do, to, to do a sample, Use, do this with a sample, right? Since we can't observe all of them, we can sample at least maybe 100 fathers, right? And we get 100 sons' height and test the relationship. Because then that will be the representative, okay, of all the things. And we, then we draw an inference. And that's what usually happens. According to Pearson, <clears throat> let's look at the Pearson sample on the father's height. You find this extract from. Damoda Gujarat, I sent you some uh, some books. Did you see them in the book in the in the group? Those uh, well, those versions of uh, economic basics of econometrics that Damoda wrote. Yes, you saw them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very very necessary. They they are all the same. Just pick one. You can pick the fourth edition because it has the solutions. The one that has got solution, I sent you the other one with the solutions. Okay, so how it works is that at the end of the, the writing, there are some questions that the Damoda Gujarat was writing, was asking the students. Then there are solutions. There is the other batch that has solutions to those questions. You can still use that as part of the, your studying materials. Okay, question and answer. It would still help you. The scatter diagram from Damoda Gujarat shows the height of 1,078 fathers and their full grown sons in England, circa 1900. This is when this was tested. Okay. There is one dot for each father son here, son pair, sorry, father son pair. So there is a son height up on the vertical axis and uh, the father's height on the horizontal axis. So each dot, like your test, your, um, they were plotting, right? You're doing some scatter plots. Uh, if say a father is, is 60 inches in height, then you find that the, the son is maybe 60 some, uh, 50 something in height, isn't it? You put a dot just like X comma Y, you know those things, X comma Y, so they are plotting all these dots in short. They are plots, okay? So you can see a lot of them. Now what happens is that there is a line, okay? That should cut in between dividing these dots equally. This line here, it cuts in between. It fits, it's called the line of best fit, all right? So when you use the ordinary least square ORS method, 
we can get this line. We can manage to get this line. We are seeking to find this line that cuts in between, that fits the data, right? The data is just scattered, but there should be the line that fits in between here. So using the ordinal least square method, we can come up with the line, the equation. Okay, there is a, 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 an equation that can give us this line. And your equation shall be of the form sun's height, right? Co constant, uh, beta one, father's height, right? Or to simplify the version, it can go as y is equal to constant a plus c, b t, b x like that. Okay, where a is a constant. You can use numbers, these numbers, the, the numbers on the y axis and the numbers on the x axis to regress them to come up with this equation. That is where we are going and you will know how to do that. That equation that you get, it is called the line of best fit. It, fits, it, it cuts through between the data, trying to divide the data equally. Is that clear? The regression line. Is that a question? No, no, I was just saying. Okay, so this one is called the regression line. Then uh, the regression line, there is an equation that you can come up with this equation it is called the, the regression equation okay the regression equation using that same equation and use these figures you can plot now this line okay you can plot this line using that equation it can just come out straight like that that is the line that we seek to find now the idea behind the ordinate least square or ls this is the idea that is behind there. You have the X variables, you have the Y variables. So the idea is to find the number one, the constant alpha, right? You want to find alpha, let's say Y is equal to alpha, which is the constant plus beta one, X, okay, plus the disturbance. So the idea behind the online list is square method, we use this, to find these numbers here, the alpha, the constant, and the beta one. Is that clear? The coefficient. Okay, that's the, 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 the whole idea behind that. Econometric model, econometric modeling now. So you find that see, the models that we deal with, typically they include deterministic and the stochastic part. There is the deterministic part. Uh, deterministic part is this one. Then there is also the stochastic part. Stochastic part, right? The stochastic part is called the, uh, this error term, right? So what are some of the terms now that are used to, to this equation? Number one, y is called the dependent variable. Then the x one is an independent explanatory or regressors, right? Uh, then in this one is called the random error term with expected value or the mean of zero. The mean for the error term, the stochastic variable is zero. Then these are called the parameters, right? Beta one coefficient plus beta, uh, this is the constant, plus beta two coefficient, the covariate variable plus the stochastic variable. So these numbers here, we call them the parameters, okay? So understand these terms, very, very important to get them so that as we will be, as I will be using them in the, in the study, at least you understand what I mean by model parameters. You know what, what we mean. Like we, are, we are referring to beta one, beta two, and these betas. Now, how do you interpret the parameters? These beta one, beta naught, how do you interpret them? That's a question. Okay. Let's start from there. Let's start from the, the, this point. So basic econometric model, this one, it is called the basic or the simple econometric model. Okay. So, what happens is that uh, 
if you are given this, okay, the, the Y condition on X taking the value of zero will be equal to beta one. The simpler term of saying this is that if you're given this equation, beta naught plus beta one X, what it says is that if this X variable is zero, all right, then the value of Y will be beta naught, okay? If X is zero, which means that if the independent variable does not change, right? Then the dependent variable will be equal to the constant. That is the meaning of beta naught, right? Which is actually the value of the Y variable when the X variable is zero. Is that clear? That's how you interpret. So you can say, for example, if you say Y is the salaries, right? And this is level of education X. So you can say the value of, or the salary that one ends when the value of education or when the level of education is zero. That is how you interpret the, the beta naught. What about beta one now? Beta one is the value of Y, the, the, the change in Y as a result of change in what? In X. By how much does Y change when X change? So in that case, using the same example of salaries and education, we can just say that when education changes by one unit, I don't know the unit, maybe the unit can be the years, then Y, salary changes by such percent, such units, by beta one units, okay? Y changes by beta one units when X changes by one unit. That is very, very necessary. So, <clears throat> That's how you interpret those two. But don't worry about the error term, just, just as I said, it is there to capture the stochastic variable. Now, let's look at the assumptions. Let's look at the assumptions of the model. Just as I said yesterday, yesterday I said that this model has got assumptions, right? There are some assumptions that underpin the model. Number one, don't forget these assumptions. Like that's where the whole conversation lies. Linearity. This model has got an assumption. The model or the, the assumption of linearity. So we assume that the best Linear regression requires the mod, uh, like this equation, requires that the linear, uh, the, the, the parameters should be linear, okay? The model is expected to be linear in parameters, not linear in variables. I'm sure now you know the difference between the parameter and the variable, right? I just mentioned that. So parameters are these, they should be linear in parameters, not linear only in variables. In variables, they cannot be linear. For example, you can have y is equal to beta naught, right? Plus what? Plus beta one, then x, x to the power x, like we take x up on top right, as a power. We can use some, that is, that simply means that this model is not linear in, a, in variables, but it is still linear in parameters, right? The parameters are still in the same line, but the variables are not linear because this one is upward, it's upward. But you can use some mathematics, okay, techniques to drop this, this uh, variable. You can do some conversions you Can use the, the, uh, the logarithms, the exponential, all those things that you learned in mathematics, you can drop it down. So that's not a problem. So don't worry if the variable is the variables are not linear. That's not a problem. Just know that this is still okay. But we are we can be worried if the parameters are not linear. For example, you have y is equal to beta naught, right? Plus x one beta one. You see, if the the parameter the parameters stop being in the same line, stop being linear, then we have a problem. So we assume that this model is always linear, right? That is to say, these parameters, in parameters, the parameters are 
in the same line. That is to say, the parameters being referred to is beta one, beta two, just as I say, as we say. What about this model, where beta is upward? Okay, okay. What about that model? So with this one, it exists. Okay, when you do transformation of non-linear estimation, that not under linear, okay? Not under the ordinary least square where we're dealing with linear quantities, not this one. This one is not linear, okay? So we need that. The other assumption that we are talking about is independency, right? The independency. So there should be no exact linear relationship between the X variables or the independent variables. Those variables that you're dealing with, they should not be related, they, like they should not be dependent of each other, right? Like one variable depends on the other. You, you fail to know the impact, which variable is impacting which one. Make sure that your dependent variables, the independent variables are linear, they are, they are, they are independent, okay? They are independent. To, to, which means that there should be no at relationship. Okay. Is that clear? Have you understood the this uh, assumption? The linear independence of the regressors or the X variables, the, the independent variables. Um, maybe you can go through that one again. Okay, thank you. So I am saying that for this one, you have to make sure that the X variables, right? They are not uh, linear, linear mm -hmm. related, meaning they shouldn't be related. Don't you choose the X variables or, or the influencing variables that are, that are just related, okay? It will be difficult to know which variable impacts the other variable. The idea is that all these independent variables that you choose, that they determine the Y variable, they should be independent of each other. Okay, that is what the assumption uh, means. So those independent variables really have to be independent of each other. Clear? Okay. Yes. Strict exogeneity is another assumption. Okay. So we require the errors, those error terms, right? to have the conditional mean of zero. There should be no, the, the mean of the error term, the stochastic variable should be zero. That's the assumption. So X communicates no information about expected value of the disturbance, right? It has got no information. So that is to say the expected variable, let's say the expected variable of the stochastic variable given X, should be equal to what? To zero. You remember under conditional probability in statistics, that's how you read this. Remember what you learned. The expected value of the stochastic variable given X, given the independent variable, is equal to zero, meaning there is no mean, okay? So the mean, we always expect the mean of the error term to be what? To be zero. The other assumption, is the assumption of spherical disturbance. Spherical disturbance. So with this one, <clears throat> you can uh, assume that uh, the variances, okay? The variances that are there for, I am simplifying the language. The variances that are there for each observation, especially of those independent variables, they are the same throughout. They are constant, okay? That is an assumption that we make. We make an assumption that these um, variances, they're just the same. They are not different, okay? So if we assume that uh, the error terms have the same variances in each observation, right? Then that is called homocedasticity, right? This assumption is what we make. The assumption of homocedasticity. But when you don't have equal variances, if your variances are not the same, 
then you have a problem of called heteroscedasticity. Heteroscedasticity is a problem. It simply means that now those variances are not the are not the same. We will look at this problem of heteroscedasticity because it's a challenge to the linear model, to the model that we are using. If these what these variances are not the same, if they keep on changing from each error term to the other error term, right? The, the variances keep on changing, then we have a problem. The idea is that they should just be the same. So that is what we'll be looking at some other height when you look at heteroscedas. This will be like, okay, what if now the variances keep on changing from each error term to the other error term? What do you do? We'll teach you how to correct that and how the data looks like when the, 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 the variances keep on changing or when you have the problem of heteroscedasticity of error times, okay? We make another assumption of non-autocorrelation. It's another key assumption, non-autocorrelation. Non-autocorrelation, we mean that non-autocorrelated error terms are uncorrelated between observation. That's, we assume. We assume that the error terms are not correlated, okay? There is no correlation between the error terms. The error terms are not correlated. That is an assumption. Then if we have, uh, we have this case, if we have the case whereby the, the covariance, where we have the covariance, which is the relationship, that measures the relationship. I think that you did in statistics, that covariance measures the relationship, right? X uh, epsilon, which is the disturbance variable, the stochastic variable given X, the independent variable, if we find that it is not equal to zero, then just know that uh, this assumption is not holding. The assumption of, uh, the assumption of, uh, uh, non autocorrelation. If this is not equal to zero, if it is not equal to zero, the, 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 the relationship is not equal to zero. It means that there is some what? There is some correlation. And we don't need correlation. So what we need is the condition where I have the covariance of the stochastic variable given x it should be equal to what? To zero, which means there is no relationship. There is no correlation between the error terms, okay? But if you have the same error terms, uh, we have the same, uh, we have uh, the correlation, then we have what is known as the case of autocorrelation. We'll show you how to detect if in the data that you're dealing with, you have autocorrelation. Right now, by speaking, you might not know, but when you use the, the statistical packages, you will know how to detect that in the data if you have autocorrelation among the error terms when you specify them on. Then we'll show you how to correct that. Of course, there are corrections. So you, you learn how to correct, the, how to detect and how to correct. Okay. So we assume that the homocedasticity and the non autocorrelation for error terms are supposed to be spherical disturbances that is what we referred uh, that's what is referred to spherical disturbances okay we are just talking about these two assumptions the assumption of homocedasticity and the non auto correlation we assume that the error terms are not correlated the fifth assumption which is uh, like the, the list as the last assumption that we look at is the assumption of what normality right normality Normality, very, very important. We assume that the error terms are normally distributed with a mean zero and a constant variance. This is the assumption. We make an assumption that the error terms are normally what distributed and their mean is zero and the variance is constant. This is just an assumption. Okay. This is very, very useful when you're conducting hypothesis testing that the error terms are normally distributed. But what happens is that now, sometimes you can find that the error terms are not normally distributed. They don't follow the Bell shape, right? 
Remember the bell shape that you learn under standard normal distribution and in statistics those days, right? Normal distribution. Like the error terms are not normally distributed. Then the question of the day is, what if they are not normally distributed? How can you tell if they are not normally distributed? Those are the things that we'll be looking at. We'll teach you how to detect that, okay? We'll teach you how to detect that the, uh, these, um, uh, these error terms are not normally distributed and how to correct. How can you make sure that they, are, they get to be normally distributed? That's the test of normality, right? Is that clear? Yes, it is. Yes. So basically, that's what is there. We want you to be able to, 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 to look at these assumptions. And uh, these assumptions, they are very, very necessary for this model to hold in the meantime. Because without these assumptions, then the model is not holding. There is an exercise which is a homework that you're going to be doing throughout the week on how to derive the parameters, how to derive beta naught plus beta what, beta one x, this equation. We want you to estimate this equation as the stochastic variable. It's just some simple homework. Okay. So the hint is that you, we want you to derive, right? Derive the ORS estimators using calculus. And that is one of the things that you do in statistics, how to derive the ORS estimators using calculus, chain rule, of course. You do that, you differentiate on both sides, just like that. So if you have not remembered, I'm going to give you the recording to remind you of that.